Fun fact, that number is now over 3 million, which, ironically, the comic to break that number was the one referenced in Glass. You know what, let's just fix that and that. Hello, my name is M. Night Shyamalan, and here's an artistic tilt down revealing this opening shot was in a mirror. Oh, what's that? Why, yes, my character being introduced will be called Mr. Glass. <sighs> I love this movie. Elijah and his mother wearing purple right from day one. There were no problems. Did you drop them? This first pan over to the doctor's actual face, who has so far only been seen in the mirror, to bring the gravity of the situation into focus. It appears that your baby has sustained some fractures while inside your uterus. His arms and his legs are broken. <laughs> Which is brutal. It doesn't get much more late 90s than this. And if it's James Newton Howard 90s, it's a win. There are few scenarios in which this makes David look good. I mean, even if he's a widower, it comes off at best a little too thirsty. Which is a testament to so many things. Bruce Willis being generally likable and sympathetic in the long run, and the way Knight wrote David allows us to empathize with him as a flawed, broken eh, person. Do you like football? Not really. Such a rote answer for him, he doesn't even think twice. He had to quit to be with his wife, so it's part of who he is now. Are you looking for any male synchronized swimmers? I'm thinking about getting into that. I'm afraid of water. I think that's a problem. It just exhilarates me when a script is this well thought out. The joke about synchronized swimming adds to sleazy David just lying through his teeth about everything. Except that he is afraid of water. What's presented as a joke is actually the truth. I know I'm being hard on David here. For all intents and purposes, he and Audrey are separated. I mean, this train ride is his trip back from a job interview in a different state. I just like that the setup of our two main characters are the opposite of what you might expect. Elijah is introduced broken right from day one, making us immediately sympathize with him, while our hero is presented like this. Married man bad. Kuleshov effect in action right here. Because we know the context, we project judgment, disappointment, even disdain onto this girl's facial expression. But her expression is actually fairly neutral, and at her age, she probably has no concept of what just happened. But David is also experiencing the Kuleshov effect, so he needs to leave her gaze. Okay, this is a win that I'd typically pull for the conclusion, but I'm leaving it here because it's early in the movie and it informs so much of why I love Night and Unbreakable. A locked off camera with your subject in the background isn't some insanely difficult camera technique, center frame symmetrical composition wasn't new or groundbreaking, and it's not like Knight invented cool blue color grading. But put it all together and it's storytelling, which is still the best thing happening in this scene. David is in the background being told he's one of two survivors while we see the other survivor bleed out and die in the foreground in real time, solidifying the absolute inexplicability of David's survival. David is center frame but is leaning away from the center throughout the scene as if he's trying to escape the spotlight. The scene is graded with a cool palette so that David's greenish yellow shirt sticks out like a sore thumb, further separating him from the rest of the ordinary, broken, bleeding world. This is our introduction to David, the reluctant, unbreakable superhero. This was our introduction to David, the broken man, blending in and conforming to his surroundings. Now he stands alone inside a comic frame, nonetheless. Hugging. Hugging. You can even hear the distant sounds of the train when David is leaving the hospital as if it's seared into his hearing like superhero tinnitus. Being unbreakable doesn't make you unshakable. The start of a common theme that Elijah expounds on later. The note is even written in a comic font. Also, you might get tired of hearing the word glass, but here we are again, David seeing Elijah's note through glass that Elijah put on his glass windshield, and the next scene begins with David feeling enveloped in Elijah's question shown by him beginning the scene in the glass of the mirror. While visually embodying the green guard or the overseer by watching over people he's there to protect, as well as hearing a subdued version of his triumphant music, we then cut to David's face and realize he clearly isn't fulfilling his needs. And watching men do something he was so much better at wouldn't make that any easier. A camera push in emphasizing that David is starting to take this idea seriously and it allows us to as well. Reintroduction of Elijah at 13, again in glass and in his signature purple. A character-defining, trilogy-defining, life-defining moment a limited edition comic, the cover of which is the first piece of art we see Elijah showing in his store. Cover art depicting a strong man in green and a beast in yellow battling inside a purple present wrapped in purple tissue paper. His mother set the course of his life right down to the moment of his death. It all happened under his control. The other colors only pop because of the backdrop of purple. The world would never have seen the beast or the overseer if it weren't for Mr. Glass. And it's exactly why it's given such ceremony. We all got the feeling that it's just about the comic book in general. Comics define Elijah's world broadly, but it's this specific one that sets his life in motion. All as a result of his mother's push to not pity himself and take his life into his own hands, even if it meant pain. Come on! They call me Mr. Glass at school, because I break like glass. You make this decision now. Your whole life, you will always 
be afraid. They say this one has a surprise ending. Even on his second widely successful movie, it's like Knight was predicting his meme ability. One last time, adult Elijah now introduced in reflection in glass. Do you see any Teletubbies in here? I get it, I, I truly do, but like, also, how are you going to teach your kids to appreciate art if you never let them see it? I'm sure he's just going to hang it on his wall. Anyway, Elijah needs patrons and audience members alike to know that comics are serious business. That's his mythos. It insults him that this realistic depiction or something he believes is real will go to a child. And once more, we see David meet Elijah through glass as well as being framed inside the window panes just like, you guessed it, a comic panel. I believe comics are our last link to an ancient way of passing on history. When the characters reach the magazine, they were exaggerated, chewed up in the commercial machine, got jazzed up, made titillating cartoon for the sale rack. This is what I was talking about when David's hand was shaking. Shyamalan wants it to be clear that David could exist in our world. Couldn't there be someone else, the opposite of me at the other end? Elijah talks about David being the other end of his spectrum and David's musical flourish placed subtly underneath the eerie score. Glass chandelier pointing down at David? Hmm. Serendipitous that Ian Embankment would drive off an embankment. More importantly, this article about the train hints that there was nothing wrong with it. Meaning sabotage. Again, hearing the train in the back of his mind. You almost don't even notice it like it's part of the background noise, which is exactly how it would feel to David at this point. I mean, trains run all through Philly, so it could literally be background noise, but think about how haunting that would be anyway. I'm prepared for any answer, and it won't affect me. The answer won't affect me. I mean, it won't affect me either way. Have you been with anyone? No. <laughs> There's always something surreal but also palpable about Knight's dialogue. It's so on the nose, but this is how people talk to each other when they're uncomfortable. Again, maybe it's not groundbreaking cinematography, but shooting David behind bars since he's still locked in his normalcy, his stage one ordinary world, as well as locked in a life that brings him sadness. It's just not something we were seeing at the time in comic book movies. Also, as we'll see over and over, it's a comic frame. It's kind of dumb that anyone was surprised, myself included, that Elijah turned out to be a mastermind supervillain with that trench coat. As David gets weary of Elijah again, which, by the way, he always seemed to have a feeling about Elijah, which he ended up being right about, further lending to the idea that David's gift is not as literal as depicted for us. But how do you visualize a six? Oh, no, no, they're different. Stop it. But as he starts to get uncomfortable, the camera pulls away from their conversation, making us feel like we want David to follow the camera and exit the conversation. World building. Just a few seconds on screen to explain the nitpicky question of how the crap does Elijah drive anywhere without breaking his butt on every pothole. Now we're put on edge by the camera shake leading Elijah down the walkway. Glimpses of Elijah's purple lining. Well, there was your first mistake, thinking your namesake should inform Kane material choice. But this insanely stressful and then ruthlessly brutal scene is precisely why the flashlight dropping scene in glass was so tense. And it was all worth it for the confirmation. In his mind, Elijah is willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to expose the truth, even himself, as it were. They say he can run the 40 in 4.3 seconds. I've heard. Good luck going pro without an agent. Too soon. Too soon. You think you could have beaten up Bruce Lee? No. <laughs> The sound effects of the iron bending and the look on David's face sell the inhuman quality of this lifting. This is David surpassing his human limitations. Every time weight is added, he feels like it's the peak of his strength, only to find out that it's all just in his head, and since his muscles can't be broken or torn, he can't give himself a hernia, he can push harder without fear of injury. You should never do anything like this. <laughs> and every time they add more, he makes Joseph move a little further away. <laughs> This time he lifts the camera as well. No! Poor Kevin Wendell Crumb. I'm sure it'll all work out for you in the end. He lay on the bottom of the pool for five minutes, and when they pulled him out, he was dead. Apparently, David can die from drowning and then still be okay. Hmm. Good to know. He'll die, Joseph. I'll just shoot him once. Joseph, listen to what your mother. <laughs> what a freaking tense scene. We have no clue still, honestly, if he has bullet immunity. That bullet is just gonna bounce off me and I'm not going to be hurt. Fun fact, this scene is apparently based on a story from George Reeves, TV Superman, that may or not be true about a kid bringing a gun to a signing and then the scene playing out almost exactly the same, except Soup said the bullet would ricochet and hurt someone else. And friends listen to each other. They don't, they, and they don't shoot each other. Uh, uh, do they, Audrey? No shooting friends, Joseph. <laughs> oh, it's so tense, but still funny, but oh, it's still so tense. 
The drawing in front of them depicts a hero in the shadow of the clutches of an evil clawed villain's hand as Elijah tries to pull David back in. There have been three major disasters. I watched the aftermath of that plane crash. I watched the carnage of the hotel fire. The 737 crashes on takeoff. A hotel fire downtown. I love that while Shyamalan is telegraphing to the audience that Elijah was responsible for the disasters, this is now the third time he's brought them up, Elijah is also showing that it hasn't dawned on him yet who he is. He's so out of touch, he just casually brings them up over and over. Heroes don't get killed like that. Normal people do, right? Again, good to know for the future. Since this movie firmly establishes David as a hero, right? Right? Okay, so now that we're hitting the fifth time something or someone is flipped upside down and or then flipped right side up or someone has to tilt their head to see things from a different perspective, I'm feeling a motif. It very well could just have been a stylistic choice by night, but the easiest narrative reason would be the idea of opposites. It's all leading to what the inevitable has to be. Elijah is the upside down version of David. This movie is about perspectives and opposites. How much for this one? <laughs> Knight doesn't get enough credit for his deadpan comedy. I had a nightmare. I didn't wake you up so you could tell me that it was okay. What a crush you human moment. It's such a convoluted statement that we all immediately understand. One of those things that's no one's fault, but it's still there. That's where this group, the Coalition of Evil, tried to ascertain the weakness of every superhero because they all have one. And even the Shamrock Coalition of Evil was foreshadowed. I think there's a misconception about this scene. This isn't David miraculously remembering what happened after forgetting. He never forgot, we just didn't know. It would be easy for him to explain the doorway as adrenaline and the rest he needed to keep to himself so he could be with Audrey. Hey man, are you hurt? Real life doesn't fit into little boxes that were drawn for it. Lining up that line with David going from framed by the pillars to the swarm of humans in the terminal. The potentially most realistic, making it the most depressing idea presented by this film is that David is one man and there's no way he could stop all these terrible people. The latter two being people that need to be stopped. It's a sour choice to escalate the crimes beyond what's palatable and I give Shyamalan credit for going there. Sometimes you just have to go for the murderers. It's almost like Knight can't help but compose beautiful shots. Saving some kids. <laughs> what a terrifying reveal. I've always loved the way the curtains hide him until the wind blows just right. There are a lot of scary things that happen in this movie. The buildup of this entire scene as David creeps around the house never knowing when the bad guy might show up is tension epitomized. But the climax of all that being just some innocuous, life-giving water? Yeah, I wouldn't even fake this scene for a movie, let alone try to survive it in real life. Top tier worst nightmare right there. Hey, James Newton Howard, take all the wins. You two kids, saving that stranger that helped against the other stranger. Oh, this score, this triumph, this confirmation of what Joseph wanted to be true, what we all wanted to be true. The swell of the music creates a feeling of victory as David becomes the hero. This scene still brings tears to my eyes, which is weird since it's a scene with a dude choking out another dude, but that's credit to the storytelling that came before. And as much as this is a fight, I love that David really embraces his power set, never even throwing a punch. He just puts the guy in a rear naked choke and holds on while he gets hit. <clears throat> And much like his shaking hands after the accident, he's still just a guy. He hasn't done this and the adrenaline is gonna be pumping. And once more, just so we get it, it doesn't all work out because it's not a comic book. <laughs> like she's made of feathers. Had a bad dream. Did it involve drowning? Right. That's a good way to crush that stone cold heart of yours. Seriously, one of the best and most emotional scenes ever. A mostly silent communication between father and son whose relationship has been strained over the truth of his power. A father admitting to his son that he was wrong while also becoming an even bigger symbol in his son's eyes. It's a scene that encapsulates the father-son relationship literally and metaphorically. A dad being able to actually fill that role that all kids see their dads in. There's the soldier villain who fights the hero with his hands. The beast uses his teeth a lot, but I get your point. A little self-indulgent to have that comic based on your own agency there, Fury. When you woke up this morning, was it still there? The sadness. No. The price of David's happiness is learning who Elijah really is, which would put a damper on that happiness. Even now, being unsure about David, Elijah was preparing for his next test. 
the best and scariest thing about this super villain arch nemesis, whatever you want to call Elijah, is that you don't need to suspect him. Disasters like this happen all the time, and it'd be safe to assume he wasn't responsible for all of them. Maybe these were just ones he tracked before getting involved. However, James Cole was there for that one. Brad Pitt too. To not know your place in this world. To not know why you're here. But as I think this video has shown, it's barely even a twist if you're looking for it. It wouldn't make sense any other way, and that's exactly what makes a good twist. As the realization settles in for both of them, the camera hurriedly pulls away from both. Now that we know who you are, I know who I am. And in that way, he wins. That's all he wanted. And holy shnikes, Batman, Samuel L. Jackson is putting on a seminar. The mix of guilt with elation, the break in his voice, he's somehow proud and ashamed with one expression and tone of voice. This movie isn't the same without either of these men. In a comic, you know how you can tell who the arch villain's going to be? He's the exact opposite. Of the hero. I feel like you could walk away from this movie wondering why Elijah gave himself up and not realize that this line right here explains it succinctly. See the villain's eyes? They insinuate a slightly skewed perspective on how they see the world. He didn't know he was the villain. He realized it shortly before allowing David to touch him. He didn't know what David's powers would be or what side that would put each of them on. And there's nothing that says he identified with any of the characters in the comics he read until this moment. And most times they're friends like you and me. Also, at least they go on to stop Hans's brother together. They called me Mr. Glass. Ha! <laughs> Audrey's maiden name was in Verso. Starting to think that upside down choice was a deliberate motif after all. I saw Unbreakable on vacation one summer as an uncultured 15-year-old because my much wiser 22-year-old brother said it was a different kind of comic book movie. I fell in love immediately, but probably couldn't have told you why. I'm now an uncultured 34-year-old and can tell you that it was scenes like this. It was so different from anything I'd seen before, not to mention what superhero or comic book movies it offered at the time. Unbreakable is the secret but not so secret comic book movie that... It's like once someone points it out to you, you can't not see all the hints. The flat center framing common in comic panels combined with the extreme high and low angle shots as well. Or the actual frames inside frames made by doorways, curtains, even train seats. You could start pulling this movie apart frame by frame to build a comic book. Shots are usually long and drawn out as if you're staring at a still page. Some scenes are actually one camera angle for the entire scene. Even the alliteration of David Dunn's name, like Peter Parker, Billy Batson, and Matthew Murdock before him. You probably noticed how often I bring up camera movements. The camera is like a living, breathing character in this film, something used more in horror but works really well here. Creeping up on characters, even sometimes taking over their point of view, making you feel what the characters are feeling, or even better, making you feel what you want the characters to be feeling. DP Eduardo Sea had a lot to do with that. You also might have found yourself rolling your eyes a few times in this video because of connections that I drew or meanings I inferred. But like I said last week, it's why I love this visual medium. Maybe things weren't consciously intended by Shyamalan, but that doesn't mean it was just a flip of a coin. Can't artists create compelling art subconsciously? Could David's lockers have been painted green because in his unfulfilled life, it's the closest he gets to being the hero he was born to become? Lindsay Ellis has a great video on the death of the author I recommend, sort of looking at it from the other side. Ultimately, I'm willing to give Shyamalan credit for how good this movie is, regardless of the details. Shyamalan and Bruce Willis. Bruce is very subdued and can feel one note at times in this film, but he nails the juxtaposition of a physically unbreakable body with what we clearly see as a broken heart and mind. You can also look at it as the wall that he's put up between himself and his family is unbreakable. No matter how much Audrey reaches out, he doesn't let his guard down until he fulfills his purpose. Sort of another midlife crisis allegory from the time when the scariest thing going on for a guy like David was Y2K. Like I pointed out, our mains are introduced as opposites, even opposite from where they end up. And while it serves as a great misdirect, it's also something Shyamalan did purposefully to ground this movie. To ground even the terrifying and heinous actions of Elijah Price. To force you to feel sympathy for a mass murderer. A very literal broken man trying to figure out how he fits into the world, destroying it in the process. Make no mistake, there's no sunny side to Elijah's crimes. They're evil and it doesn't matter how confused he may have been. Where in Glass, I had a hard time feeling that triumph we were given at the end, I leave Unbreakable, at least agreeing that the way the movie wants me to feel is warranted and earned, and very few movies have left me this uneasy in the best way possible. Elijah believed he had a purpose, and once he found out what it was, I think it destroyed him. It could be an Alanis Morissette lyric, or maybe empowered him if you look into the future. 
There was no cost too great to find his antithesis and give meaning to his life. Or at least that's what he thought. I truly believe Elijah didn't see himself as the villain. In the end, he realized not only that he obviously was the villain, but that he was wrong, and that the cost was too high. That's the beauty of this film. It fits so perfectly inside the comic framework, but ends up telling a story about characters that were ahead of their time. You could interpret this ending as Mr. Glass fully embracing his identity and in the same breath immediately discarding and renouncing it. Or maybe he's just remorseful for what he sees as his only path. Text endings are whatever, but this ending, it's something else. I'm not pretending like Glass doesn't exist, but this is still my David Dunn story. So I finally got around to Unbreakable. This movie is actually pretty divisive, something I wasn't entirely aware of before researching it. Coming off The Sixth Sense and then delivering another twist is probably Shyamalan's greatest regret. No one will ever walk into another one of his movies without expecting it now. And since it was the, not the best thing about The Sixth Sense, but the thing people remember and talk about, he really had no chance with this one. Had this been his first movie, I don't think it would have gotten nearly the mixed reception it did. It was also sold wrong, but hey, it stood the test of time and it's one of my favorites. Speaking of mixed receptions, nah, you all love my shirts. I've got shirts. I often forget to bring it up, and by that I mean I never bring it up. But just a reminder that I do have a store now with some shirts and a mug, and I actually did a community post recently where you guys gave me a ton of things to look into and think about. So more coming soon. Next week, a big movie. Osteogenesis Imperfecta Thought he was a mistake He finally found a purpose Turns out he's evil And isn't it ironic